followers of the religions of the East, of Buddhism and Hinduism, Taoism and Shinto, have created some of the world's most extraordinary buildings and some of its most exquisite art. I'm John McCarthy, and I'm fascinated by these ancient belief systems. In Art of Faith, I'm visiting the temples and shrines they've inspired across the centuries. And in this film, I'm looking at the great monuments of Hinduism, a religion with roots from almost three millennia ago. I'm on an architectural odyssey to see some of the most remarkable buildings of the Hindu faith. It's a journey that starts here at India's Ellora Caves and will take me right across the subcontinent and beyond. My travels by train, taxi and more singular types of transport will follow the history of the Hindu temple across 800 years. We'll start with a true wonder of the world from more than 12 centuries ago. And as we come closer to our own time, we'll see how Hinduism in India and in Cambodia inspired a truly glorious art of faith. Hinduism has more than a billion followers worldwide, the vast majority of them living here in India. It's often said it's the world's oldest living religion, and yet with its many gods, it has no single founder and no unified system of belief spelt out in a creed. It's a rich and complex faith whose diversity is powerfully reflected in its iconography and architecture. If you bring traditional Western preconceptions about religion to Hinduism, then you're going to have a hard time pinning it down. One scholar has even said that Hinduism cannot be defined but it's only to be experienced. Certainly it can seem extraordinarily diverse. Most followers believe in both the supreme God as well as numerous distinct deities like Vishnu, Rama, Krishna and Shiva and a goddess as Lakshmi or Parvati, all of whom are in some way the God in human form. In many ways, the most characteristic artistic expression of Hinduism is the temple. These temples are intended to be a link between the world of man and the world of the gods. At times, the way that link is realized is absolutely astonishing. Carved from a solid mountainside, this is the Kaila Sonata Temple at Ellora. Cave temples in India date from as early as the third century BCE, but some of the most spectacular are the much later ones here at Ellora. There are Hindu, Buddhist and Jain temples hewn out of the mountainsides here, but the Kaila Sonata temple, cut out of the rock from the top down, is the great centerpiece. Kaila Sonata was started around 760 by King Krishna I, the ruler of the Rashtrakuta Empire, which controlled much of India from the 6th to the 10th century. It took at least a hundred years to complete, and it's rather as if Sir Christopher Wren had told his masons to start at the top of St Paul's and carve their way to the bottom. Dr Moran Chika has studied the architecture of Kaila Sonata for many years. So it's an amazing thing to take on. How did they actually do it? I mean, it's just amazing to think that there was so much rock here, yes, exactly. which isn't here anymore. You will find that it is cut from top to bottom. Means you have to imagine the things perfectly when you are coming down, you are descending. Once you descend, it is very difficult to rectify, add, alter, modify, nothing can be done. All those things are to be removed in such a fashion that whatever remains will be in a perfect, beautiful, magnificent, unmatchable form. This place is absolutely amazing. Coming in here, it's like a, your heart skips a beat and you think, can this be real? Here's a massive temple and I'm in a mountain. It's estimated they needed to cut out 200,000 tons of rock to leave this beautiful artwork here. 
as well as the solid mass of this place and the architecture, there are also these beautiful, delicate little carvings too, with hundreds of figures just in one mural. Of course, all Hindu temples are supposed to be the home, the abode of a deity. This one is dedicated to the Lord Shiva. Indeed, the whole structure is meant to emulate his mountain fortress in the Himalayas, Mount Kailash. The idea that the Hindu temples link the worlds of the gods with the worlds of man sometimes uh, is expressed in a very natural, natural way. Up here, there are statues of couples involved in very intimate, amorous embraces. As you look at all of these wonders, it's as if you have to keep pinching yourself to remember that it's all carved out of the mountainside. Nothing or whatever has been built. The solid rock has simply been chipped away from around and even inside everything here. But it's as you get to the back of the temple, the full weight of the mountain comes back down upon you. It's awe-inspiring to be standing here and realizing there up behind me there are people walking in the colonnades, right in the heart of this mountainside. And another interesting thing I've just realized is that when you go around the back of a cathedral, it's normally a pretty plain end of the building, but not here. The whole idea of Hindu temples is that they, they are 3D. Everywhere you go, you're looking at them, wondering and worshiping in a way, I suppose. The back of this temple is not a plain end. They've got 13 more elephants, beautifully sculpted, and the whole thing rising up again, emulating the idea of bringing you up towards the gods. For all their complexity and variety, almost all Hindu temples are built to a basic design. There's an entrance, which invariably faces towards the rising sun in the east. There are mandapas, or halls, and there's an inner sanctum called the Garbhagriha, or womb chamber. And directly above the Garbhagriha, there's a tower. I'm about 30 feet up in a little courtyard that leads on into the entrance to the inner sanctum. And the inner sanctum is the very heart of any temple. It's where the god's image is kept. Indeed, his or her presence is meant to permeate the space, generating a divine energy. Worshippers come here to make offerings of flowers or food, or simply to pray. Inside it's kept very dark, the idea being to generate the atmosphere of a mother's womb. Sadly, it's so pitch black in there that it's impossible to film. The design is, is extraordinary. The idea was also extraordinary. How remarkable an achievement is this, is this temple? As compared to 8th century, there was no temple in the whole world of this magnitude. And it remained exposed to the crowds, to the kings, even of different faith. They tried to demolish number of things. Still it has retained its glory, its grandeur. Frequently, it's the external ornamentation, the carving and sculpture, that is the most striking feature of Hindu architecture. It's perceived that things lacking in ornament are imperfect or incomplete. But walking through the cloisters at Kailasanatta, it's the structure that I find so overwhelming. What an incredible level of ambition, self-belief and faith to create such a wonder. While the Rashtrakuta Empire held sway over much of northern and central India, in the south, one of the main ruling dynasties was the Pallava, which dominated this area for hundreds of years, right up to the 9th century CE. I've just arrived in South India at Mamalapuram in Tamil Nadu and stumbled across this workshop. Stonemasons have been carving statues here for over 1,300 years and today their work is exported all over the world. But probably the most exquisite sculptures date from the 7th and 8th centuries and they are right here, just a few hundred yards away on the beach. 
Mamalapuram is 60 kilometers from Chennai in southeastern India on the Indian Ocean, and it was the center of the Pallava Kingdom. From the very beginning, the Pallavas were a seafaring people who spread Hindu culture right across the Indian archipelago. There's a great deal of mystery about the caves and carvings here at Mamalapuram. Nobody's exactly sure what they were used for, what they depict, and many of them aren't even finished. Take this one, for example. It's 30 metres wide, carved into the cliff face. It's called Arjuna's Penance. Now, on one level, you can just look at it and enjoy the beauty of it. Look at this lovely family of elephants down here in the bottom right-hand corner. But on the other hand, it is called Arjuna's Penance. And Arjuna is the man standing on one leg with his hands over his head, seeking the favour of Lord Shiva, who's just off to his left. It's a story that comes from the Hindu epic, the Mahabharata. One of the great ideas about this rock face is that it might have been a kind of 7th century multimedia installation, because there are water tanks above, and it's believed that they might have released that water to flow down the fissure in the middle of the rock face in an imitation of the mighty Holy River Ganges. As fine as anything in Indian sculpture is how one distinguished art historian has praised the figures in this great panorama. There's an incredible variety to the carvings and constructions here, from caves with pillared facades, shrines cut from the rock, and temples hewn out of single granite boulders. But it's still unclear to me the exact purpose of Mamalapuram, and especially of this line of carved temples. I have an expert guide to help me, Miss Sushila Kulashekha. Sushila, can, can you tell me what this place is? Uh, this place was actually like a workshop. You see, people, temples were made in southern India of wood or brick or uh, bamboo and things like that. And they were trying to make here uh, temples that were in brick and in bamboo. They were trying to copy it in stone. They had no temples built in stone before that. Stone temple comes to us much, much late because they thought stone was a dead medium that you ought to utilize only to make tombstones. Oh. So even though we had temples very long, from a very long time, we started using stone only from 600 AD in this part of India. So in a way, this place was the, the first plan, the draft for, um, for all the temples that developed in, in, yes, in southern was, India. Yes, this was probably the first place where they were testing on stone. Wow. the temples that they were making here. And can you tell me what, we, what we're seeing here? And this, this is the largest structure, I think. Yes, the largest structure, probably influenced by the Buddhist architecture. But since all the temples, monolithic temples, the work started from the top, and then they came down, the top portion seems to have been completed, but not the uh, sanctums and the outside. Okay. So they are not really finished. That, that's what makes it even more impressive. Yeah, well, because you because, can almost see what, you know, how yeah, they were what doing. they were going to do. W why was it not finished? Did the Pallava these dynasty kings, no, these kings had constant battle with the Chalukya kings. This seemed to be a big power tussle between these two kingdoms. And uh, every, every time there was a, a battle, they just left things like that and went to fight. These, these figures are absolutely exquisite. They are, aren't they? They look as if they are going for together somewhere. And look at the expression on the faces of the couple. Yeah. And the body line is beautiful. And in Pallava sculptures, you never see them as frozen figures. Right. It's always they're in the, in the midst of doing something and just frozen in that particular moment. Almost like a photograph. To make, yeah. us, to make us think, you know, that it is dynamic and static at the same time. And the, that is Shiva leaning on the bull there. Ah, I see, yeah. And uh, flanked by this fam uh, But royal. again, it's absolutely, there's such a lovely fluid in him. He really yeah. looks as though he's just le a guy leaning there. Exactly. That's amazing. For all their beauty, the sculptures at Mamalapuram don't have the incredible detail that you find in Hindu artwork elsewhere, largely because these figures are carved from granite, which is a very hard stone. But they do have a wonderful sense of dignity and presence, as you can see with this lion and the half-finished elephant. 
Having seen so much artistic creativity and human endeavour here at Mamalapuram, it seems almost flippant to end on something that's never felt a stonemason's chisel. There's a story that the god Krishna was rather partial to butter. But what size pat of butter would befit a Hindu deity? Well, this is Krishna's butter ball. Another day, another train journey, heading on to the exotic and erotic temple at Kajirao. Now, where am I sitting? I think it's over here. Okay. Kajirao is in the north of the country. Between the 10th and 12th centuries, in the years when England was coping with the Norman conquest, this was the cultural capital of the Hindu warrior dynasty of the Chandalas. This place seems very remote. After a long train ride, it was a four-hour drive through the night over extremely rugged roads. But maybe that remoteness explains why the 25 temples here at Kajarao have survived so well for over a thousand years. And there are two temples in particular I'm really looking forward to seeing today. The best preserved of the medieval temples here are concentrated in what's now an immaculately landscaped park. Completed at the start of the 11th century, the Lakshmana temple is a great example of the northern or Nagara style of Hindu temples. The most distinctive element of this style is the beehive shape of the main tower or shikara over the inner sanctum. In the south, the towers tend to taper up following the outline of the building. Although the Lakshmana temple is dedicated to the Lord Vishnu, it's actually named after a hero in the Ramayana, the ancient Sanskrit epic. Like the Mahabharata, this is not exactly a sacred book like the Bible or the Quran, but it's nonetheless hugely important to the Hindu faith, detailing the duties of a virtuous life. When the devotees first arrived at the shrine, they'd walk around it at ground level in a clockwise direction. That meant they were always presenting the right side of their body, the purer side it's considered, to the temple buildings. Then they'd come up here to the platform and again walk around in a clockwise direction looking at the four subsidiary shrines. And then they'd go on up towards the shrine of the deity itself. It's amazing to think of what this must have been like in its heyday with processions of priests and kings of the Chandela dynasty coming in to worship at the shrine. This is the entrance porch or the Arta Mandapa. And as you come into the main building, you're in the Mandapa and then the Maha Mandapa, which is the main worship hall. Beyond that, the Antarala, which leads into the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctum called the Gabagriha. And in there you can see the statue of Vishnu, the god to whom this shrine is dedicated. It's not a massive structure, but the beauty comes from the carvings. They're so, so intricate and delicate. On the wall of the exterior of the inner sanctum are yet more carvings of women. And as you walk around, the light plays on them to reveal their facial expressions and their poses. Not only is this a decorative feature, but this is the very base of the spa or the shikara of the temple. It's these incredible carvings of the some 600 gods in the Hindu pantheon that make a visit to the Lakshmana temple and the others nearby an overwhelming experience. Next to the Lakshmana temple is the Kandaraya, the largest and most ornate of the Kajarao temples. Almost its entire surface is carved in astonishing detail. The quality and scale of these carvings reflect the Hindu passion for portraying every aspect of life with an uncompromising honesty. From very early on in Indian art, women had been associated with fertility and abundance, and as such made an auspicious emblem. By 1000 CE, there were even texts for architects specifying that images of women were essential. As a house without a wife, one reads, as frolic without a woman, so without the figure of a woman, the monument will be of inferior quality and will bear no fruit.
Like the women on their own, couples also represent fertility, abundance and prosperity. Since karma, or love, was accepted as one of the goals of life, so the display of explicitly sexual images was seen as entirely appropriate. But inevitably, there's much debate about these carvings, and it's thought they may also represent the rituals of the esoteric sect of the Laulas, a tantric offshoot of Shiva worship who sought to gain spiritual fulfilment through ritual sex. Although there are erotic carvings elsewhere at Kajurao, their most splendid flowering is on the Kandaraya temple. And it's these that attract the hundreds of thousands of tourists who come each year. As a tour guide, can you tell me what's the sort of reaction, normal reaction of tourists when you bring them around the temple and show them these extraordinary panels here? Actually, in India, we do have uh, the temples where we have a depiction of Kama Sutra. But Khajuraho has more depiction of that and more visible figures are there. If you have not heard about those figures before, probably people think that this is just a pornography. But when people are explaining them, and uh, this is actually not that, it is more a spiritual pleasure. Some of these things look like they might be quite pleasurable physically <laughs> anyway, right. but, but also impossible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thinking right, you see that is a very beautiful depiction of figure yeah. of Kama Sutra, but that is more symbolic. Okay. okay. Because the man is, you see, standing on his head yeah. and there are three women. It shows that he is satisfying those three women, which is more symbolic. Yeah. But these three women actually are representing three different energy which is in human body. With, with these very uh, explicit mm -hmm. sexual scenes, people making love, embracing, I mean, I'm still not quite clear why, why they would put them on, 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 on a temple. These temples were constructed by the Chandelas and these rulers were the follower of Tantric sect. And Tantrism is a sect in India which have been practiced everywhere, but especially Khajuraho was a capital for those people. And they have built a temple to practice those Tantric rituals. So it's really by... Sex to superconsciousness. Okay. Sex to superconsciousness. So, so as you say, it's, so it's a switch of taking straightforward physical pleasure right, and right. using that yeah. in some way to, right, to, right. to generate right. a, to, a spiritual experience. To awaken the energies. The erotic figures only feature on the exteriors of the temples here, and inside the decoration is rather more, well, decorous. But the Kandaraya isn't only about its decoration. For what's actually a rather modestly sized structure, it has a wonderful sense of monumentality, and the pattern of the towers rising to different heights like a spectacular chain of mountains, well, that's pretty good too. It's easy to get lost in the eye-catching, frankly, eye-watering erotic sculptures here at Kajarao. But as you walk around, you're constantly reminded of the bigger picture. And nothing can lessen the overall impact, the power of these fantastical temples. Journeying across India, looking at Hindu architecture, I have to keep reminding myself it's not all about the great big temples and their glorious carvings. Everywhere you go, even in a rural area like this, amidst miles and miles of rice fields, there's always nearby going to be a little shrine or a temple, like this one, dedicated to Shiva. I've travelled south again, not all the way by rickshaw, I'll admit, to the town of Tangible. It seems like a fairly sleepy place now, but back at the start of the 11th century, it was the centre of the mighty Chola dynasty. And their great... Their great king, Raja Raja I, wanted to build a temple to celebrate his, uh, his triumphs, to inspire and awe his people, and of course, to glorify his gods.
one of the oldest cities in India, Tanjavur was the capital of the Chola Empire, which came to dominate this region after the defeat of the Pallavas, whose temples we saw at Mamalapuram. Just arriving at the temple gates now, as usual there's a blare of noise coming from the loudspeakers. People, even early in the morning, it's only just about 7 o'clock, are already coming in, presumably for the early puja worship ceremonies of the day. There's stalls selling fruit, vegetables, garlands of flowers. The usual excitement and hustle and bustle, even just after dawn, that goes with, a, with an Indian temple. Raja Raja Chola laid out the foundations of the Brihadiswara temple in 1002 CE, supposedly because he had been commanded to do so in a dream. This is another Hindu temple formerly dedicated to Shiva, and less formally, but no less importantly, to aligning the king with his favoured deity. This really is the most amazing building. What must it have been like for the people of the 11th century coming across these very flat plains of southern India and finding this thing rearing up out of the landscape? It's truly remarkable. And as the people come today to worship the gods, they can stop at the stores like this little one here and, and buy offerings for the deities. There are things like coconuts, bananas, and I've noticed here that there's these little packets of, uh, of powder, which I think they use as makeup before they go into the temple. Brihadiswara is a wonderfully grand complex, with the Shikara, one of India's tallest, rising up nearly 70 metres. And in contrast to the temples at Kajarao, this tower is in the southern Indian, or Dravidian style, where it rises layer by layer following the plan of the sanctuary. In fact, there are 13 storeys, conforming to the rule that all such towers should have an odd number of these. The temple itself stands in the centre of the huge square and is surrounded by halls and smaller shrines. Even today, this still ranks as India's largest temple complex. Bani Chengutawan is one of the international guides with the local Department of Tourism. Any Hindu temple is not only a place of worship. People make themselves at home, they are at ease. With such a huge structure, it was possible to congregate people, to bring in a large gathering, and that calls in for festivity and more faith and more confidence in spirituality. Brihadiswara was the world's first temple complex to be built entirely from granite. And even the statue of the bull Nandi behind me was cut from a single piece of granite weighing 15 tonnes. The sacred bull Nandi is the main attendant of the Lord Shiva. And it's believed to be important to seek his blessing before going on to worship Shiva himself. Carvings of Shiva in his warrior pose cover the main shrine, perhaps reflecting the imperial aggression and extensive conquests of King Raja Raja. Is there a, a spiritual reason for having that big spa going up? Yeah. A shrine is a representation of a human body. The more towering you make, it, it gives a feeling that you are going towards the sky or upward movement. So size doesn't matter, actually. It's only that within your body, you have the faith in God. And the basement is fine. It is just a grounding for you. Then comes the womb. See, equivalent words to refer to these architectural elements in Sanskrit is what they use for a human body. Garbha graha, which means the womb, which is the sanctum sanctorum. So it has to be dark. It does not have any window. It will have only one opening. There you conceive God inside. I've come inside to the entrance hall that leads on into the inner sanctum. 
The bell's been ringing to summon the people for the sunset puja, the sunset worship. As a film crew, we're not allowed to go any further, but even so, we can see how the architecture, how these massive granite columns give that sense of moving on into somewhere very special, into the Holy of Holies. I have been studying on temples for the past 25 years. And when I started it, it was only as a student who was interested in the way they have been built and the kind of activity which is going on in a very academic way, not at all in a pious manner. But this temple has brought in a change in me and I have developed a strong faith and affinity towards this temple which I have tried to ignore, but it has not been possible. <laughs> so that is a kind of an attachment I have within this temple, and I definitely love to come over here. I have to say that the atmosphere here is very different from a visit to a cathedral back home. As well as the pilgrims who've come to worship and the people who've come to see the great building, there are lots of others who just seem to have come for a day out family groups, groups of school children, grandparents and grandchildren just coming and relaxing, enjoying a picnic on the grass or even listening to some music. And maybe that just endorses what people keep telling me, that Hinduism isn't so much a religion as a way of life. I have one more destination in India, a city with trade links to Greece and Rome as far back as 550 BCE. It's known as the City of Jasmine, the Sleepless City, the Athens of the East. This is Madurai. It's believed to be the oldest inhabited city on the Indian Peninsula. And it sums up all that I've come to know about Indian towns. They're full of colour, people, noise, chaos, business and busyness. And motorbikes. And what's at the centre of all this energy and enterprise? It's the vast Hindu temple to the goddess Manakshi, covered with an estimated 30 million carvings and guarded by four remarkable gopura, or gateways. Most pilgrims enter here at the Eastern Gate. Manakshi, who was the consort of Lord Shiva, is worshipped mainly in southern India, and she's one of the few Hindu female deities to whom a major temple is dedicated. The temple here is later than the others that we've visited, having been built around 1600, even though the history of this as a sacred site goes back much further. And of course, these amazing, brightly coloured statues have only recently been restored. We're now inside the temple complex itself. And I'm amazed because there are a whole load more stalls in here selling all sorts of things, garlands of flowers, incense, even some toys and trinkets. Clearly people are buying things and I guess they're going to be offering them to the gods later on when we get further into the, into the Holy of Holies. Looking ahead now, one gets the feeling that one's entering into the inner sanctum, that something special is going on here. There's signs pointing towards the Temple of Shiva, which is the main god of this place. So we're now getting to the heart of the temple. And there are people everywhere just bowing and praying in front of the shrine. It's a very peaceful atmosphere. Well, there's some music going on some of the time. At the moment, it's very quiet. And everybody seems to be going about their devotions as families, often. Just stopping, praying, going with bowls of fruit that they're offering, going to offer to the gods. For most Hindus, religious practice is about ordering life to reach four goals. Dharma, or righteous living. Arta, or wealth gained through a profession. Karma, or human and sexual love, and finally moksha, or spiritual salvation, and the release from the cycle of rebirth. 
All these statues are absolutely stunning. The huge ones like that, and then these much smaller ones, which are every nook and cranny, there's another little god to look at, another little god to touch and worship. And people are going around praying at all of them. And the whole thing about this place seems to be very much the here and now, day-to-day -day life, but also thinking of the future, of the afterlife, of, of aspiring to heaven. It's even in the ceilings when you look at them. Priests and musicians are going around with flames. They seem to be almost blessing every statue as they go around, every little shrine. I'm fortunate here to meet Karamutu Kanan, who's chairman of the temple complex. This morning we arrived early, but because we're not Hindu, we weren't able to go in to see the, the puja ceremony. Okay. And I wondered if you could tell me what happens. In Hindu mythology, the gods follow um, a, a routine which is very similar to what you and I do. Right. They're woken up at five. Uh, there's a little uh, bedroom, so to say, it's known as a paliarai, yeah. and where there's a swing. So the morning, uh, the god and goddess are woken up from this, taken out from the swing, and they're offered a little uh, camphor. You know, okay. every every puja in the Hindu mythology starts with the lighting of the camphor, and that oh, brings out light. I see. Okay. So it's all about light, and that's done in the morning. Uh, they were both together at the uh, at the paliarai where they spend the night, but then they both then go back to their suites. Right. So goddess Meenakshi goes to the sanctum sanctorium of uh, Meenakshi temple and Lord Sundareshwara, that's Lord Shiva, goes to his place, that's his suite as I would call it for this purpose. This idea of them uh, being very human and treated in a human way, the way I saw some of the devotees standing at the shrines, uh, look, the intensity on them, it seems like a very personal relationship that they had. Is, is that a, a fair description? Right, see, there again here what we say is um, uh, God is formless, but um, to begin with, one has to focus on something. So the first stage of um, a religious evolution starts with coming to a temple, offering a prayer, then he closes his eyes and starts meditating for a few minutes. So that's it. Yeah. That's the first level. Then um, in the mythology describes that you, you transcend to different levels and ultimately you start seeing God in you. So that's the ultimate level. So temples are, you can say, this is the first year in college, so you come here, <laughs> you do this way, this it's, way. It's, it's the primer course. The, the beauty of this place is absolutely astonishing. I mean, for, for a visitor to mix the, the beauty, the colour, with the vibrancy of, of what's going on, all the worshippers, the, the devotees, it's in, in a very special location to be in. Does, does it always give you, a, what we say in English, a kind of a buzz when you walk, walk through, through the temple? Absolutely. I think uh, these are places uh, which uh, carry a lot of uh, positive vibrations, as we think. And uh, the more there are people, I believe these vibrations are greater. And, uh, and the chantings which are done here, the mantras which are done, we think they add to these vibrations. And uh, there are also a lot of work which has been done to say that a stone structure has got the ability to hold these vibrations and give it back to them. So today, you'll find that you are asked to come into this temple without wearing anything on your leg. You have to barefooted. So here again, the same theory holds good. They think that uh, millions and billions of people have walked on these uh, pavements. So as you also walk along, so you get some of those positive vibrations. That's a lovely thought. Thank you very much. Thank you. The uh, Hindu god Ganesha, who has an elephant's head, is seen as bringing wisdom and good fortune. And if you're blessed by a real elephant, then you can also receive those things. So I'm going to try. I'll make a small offering. And get blessed. That's fantastic. Wow. What a lovely feeling. 
They're the most amazing creatures, and I've never been up that close to an elephant before. I've escaped from the throng of pilgrims down below in the body of the temple and come up here on the roof for a very privileged look at this amazing, otherworldly architecture. As I've travelled across India, I've seen some remarkable buildings, the temples and their sculptures. But to be honest, there's really been nothing that matches up to this, the Minakshi Temple here in Madurai. Nothing that touches its scale and colour. I can't really believe there's anywhere else in the world that can come close. But there are those that say that there is one place that could rival it. To see it, I have to leave the Indian subcontinent and head east across the Bay of Bengal. just after dawn here and hundreds of people have arrived to watch the sunrise on a spectacle that perhaps does rival the Minakshi Temple in Madurai. In the jungles of Cambodia, this is the Temple to Vishnu of Angkor Wat. It's said to be the world's largest single religious building. In what in the Western calendar was the 5th century and later, Hinduism moved along trade routes out of the Indian subcontinent. Indians sailed all over the Asian world and Hindu gods began to be worshipped across Southeast Asia, including in what is today Cambodia, or what was then the centre of the Khmer Empire. From the 10th century on, the Khmers built a succession of capital cities and great religious buildings here, culminating in the sprawling magnificence of Angkor Wat. Constructed as much as an expression of political power as it was a sanctuary on earth for the gods, this astonishing edifice, surrounded by its expansive artificial moat, is only one of a host of temples scattered across this region. The area around Angkor Wat is dotted with literally hundreds of temples. This is believed to be the oldest. It's Nom Bakain, and it was built in 900, dedicated to Shiva. Erected some two centuries before Angkor Wat, Phnom Penh was in its day the principal temple of the region. With its sides precisely aligned to the four points of the compass, Phnom Penh takes the traditional Hindu form of the temple mountain. Like Angkor Wat, it represents Mount Meru, the home of the Hindu gods. This idea is reinforced by its site, perched on top of one of the very few hills for miles around. Clambering to the top will once have been a sacred rite to bring you closer to the heavens. Like hundreds of other people, I've sweated my way up the hill here for the sunset. For sunrise, they go to Angkor Wat. For the sunset, it's here at Phnom Penh. Sunsets being something of a cliché in films like this, we've actually come here for the view across the roof of the jungle to the nearby Angkor Wat. You can see from here the central tower, beneath which is the sacred shrine of Vishnu, and surrounding it are three of the smaller, although still massive, towers of the topmost level. The buildings and terraces of Angkor Wat the name means city temple, stretch away from the central complex to an outer wall with a circumference of nearly four kilometers. All of this was built from vast blocks of sandstone in just 40 years, including the exquisite carved apsaras, or celestial dancers, that seem to decorate almost every wall. In contrast to each of the other Hindu temples we visited, Angkor Wat faces west, and some scholars believe this means that its commissioner, King Suryavarman II, intended it as his mausoleum. But the west in Hindu mythology is also associated with Vishnu, to whom the temple was originally dedicated. 
Each of the terraces brings the visitor closer to the central shrine. My guide is Professor Vorti, who has studied Angkor Wat for many years, and he's going to introduce me to the incredible bas-reliefs in the galleries on the temple's first raised level. So tell me, what are these uh, pictures? What are we seeing here? What's the story? These images are depicting about the most popular, well-known Hindu mythologies we call Ramayana, especially at the scene of the Lanka battle, the fighting between the monkeys and the demons. The, the, the stories we see are Rama coming to earth and then, and then the battles to try and get his wife back. That's right. The okay. struggling here, if you look carefully, you can see the actual fighting between the monkeys and the demon. And all of these monkeys, uh -huh. they were loyal to La Rama. They oh, were okay. fighting for Rama in order to release Sita from being abducted by Ravana. Okay, okay. One statue which is standing on the shoulder of the monkey here, that is Vishnu in the form of Rama. Uh -huh. So Rama was Vishnu's reincarnation. And he was added by the monkey general, we call him the Hanuman. So Hanuman is assisting Rama in fighting against with the Ravana over there. From the scene you can see Rama is firing the arrows at Ravana over there. So in a way they're educating the people That's about the right. stories of Hinduism and, and also making the place beautiful. Sure. Which they certainly have done, yeah, it's fantastic. Sure. Beyond the galleries with the reliefs is the first internal complex of courtyards and tanks. But the layout itself is, that is to reflect the Hindu understanding of the cosmos. Yeah? It can be like that. It can be like that. And the, the whole idea of, of us coming up these various levels, and it still goes up, is that to reflect the idea of, of, of the gods living in a mountain? That's true, yes. Whatever you see from here, just they have their own significances. But the main idea is what we call the cosmological reflection, because the central tower is regarded as the sacred home of the Hindu god here. Okay. But more detail can be told as long as you go to the balloon. To the Sometimes. balloon, you can go up in the balloon. balloon. You can see the whole scenic view from the sky. That sounds like a good scheme. Yes. Because it is a confusing idea to see what, what to get the layout. That's but if right. we can go up above and see it, that's great. Sure. Yes. Okay. Only as we start to rise does my fear of heights begin to kick in. Well, uh, we're about 40 feet off the ground so far. I'm going to go a lot higher. The idea being that we're going to get a fantastic top shot of, uh, of Angkor Wat. Frankly, I'm just feeling a little bit apprehensive at the moment because there are quite a few people on board this balloon, but most of them are over there. <laughs> so this is uneven tilt, which makes it a bit alarming. Ah, but we're up above the tree line now, so with any luck, We'll see the temple in a minute, which I guess, there it is, right over there. Oh, wow. That is fabulous. God, we're a long way up. <laughs> From up here, if you can bear to look, you can see exactly how the moat and the courtyards progress towards the central tower. These waters and walls represent the oceans and mountain ranges believed to surround Mount Meru, the center of all the physical and spiritual universes. Access for worshippers to the different levels of the temple became increasingly exclusive as they neared the center. In the 12th century, the likes of Professor Varti and myself would never have reached this third level. These incredibly steep stairs, sure. where, where do they go? <laughs> the reason why all steps seem to be very steep and narrow, because upstairs it used to be the sacred shrine of the king and the home of God, and it, it was not the place for people to go up and down most of the time. Then the king and the architect, they made the steep step and narrow step like this to make people walk up slowly and pay more respect to the God. So only, only the priests and the god would be allowed to That's go up right. to the Holy of Holies. On the other hand, it could be showing that this is the way up to the heaven. To heaven. Yes. Now, we, although we're not priests or, or indeed kings, certainly not gods, we are allowed to go up nowadays. So sh should we go up and have a look upstairs? Sure, yes, okay. of course, yes. 
fantastic. It's just the most amazing place. Incredible. What, what, what do you get? It's a, such a sense it's so monumental, these huge layers, each layer is yes, vast. Yes. And especially you can see how wonderful the foundation of the temple is. Yeah. High foundation. Time to tackle that vertigo yet again. Climbing the tourist steps to the back end with its criss-cross galleries and shrines beneath each of the five towers. This really is amazing. Yes. Because, so high up. Because this is the uppermost terrace of the Angkor Wat. And it used to be the most sacred shrine of the Hindu god from the 12th century. And if you take a look at this shrine, yeah. it used to be the shrine of Vishnu, the eight-armed statue that you saw from downstairs. Down downstairs, OK. Yeah. And it was up here? Yeah. Wow. So the Buddha, Buddha statue's in there now? Sure. These are the statues of the Buddha. And sometimes people seem to misunderstand because they saw actually Angkor Wat was the Hindu temples. And how come it turns to be the statue of the Buddha? Exactly. From the 12th century, Angkor Wat was under the influence of the king who worshipped the Hindu god. But later on, the first king finished and came the following king, and then he converted the temple from Hinduism into the Buddhism. And that's why you can see the statue of the Buddha has been built in this area in replacement to the Hinduism. Okay. But I am very glad that the people never destroy the image of the Hinduism or whatever. Do, do the two religions live side by side? Sure. The Hinduism and the Buddhism are still playing the crucial role to the whole daily lives of Cambodian people all the time. We can't live without the contribution from the Hinduism and the Buddhism. The construction of Angkor Wat was more or less complete by the mid-12th century. And first Vishnu and then the Buddha were worshipped here until 1431, when the area was overrun by the neighbouring Thais. The Khmer capital was moved to Phnom Penh, and Angkor Wat and the temples around were abandoned to the jungle, only to come to the attention of the West in the 19th century. The last century and more has been dedicated to restoration and to research of a civilization that left these amazing buildings, but almost no written records. Leaving Angkor Wat, I have a real sense of quite what a spectacular, beautiful, and in so many ways special place this was, and indeed still is, as a home for the Hindu gods. In all of the extraordinary places that I've been to on this journey, I've also seen something of what Hinduism means to each and every person who comes to these temples to worship. And through my encounters with the art of Hinduism, I feel that even as an outsider, I've understood just a little of the experience of this faith. And that's something I'm unlikely ever to forget. Next time on Art of Faith, I explore the architecture and art inspired by the Buddha. I'll be back in India at the Great Stupa of Sanchi. And after a stopover in Cambodia, at what's perhaps the most extraordinary Art of Faith location of all, it's on to the spectacular carvings at Longmen in China. And we end even further east in Japan, looking at two glorious Buddhist temples built some five centuries apart.